which was totally awkward. If that doesn't work, I have I'll be walking on the personal pointer here, which will work. But but this one, I need this to flip the page. Okay. Well, you might have to you might have to dual hand it. The red ones tend to go through on the rear screens. Oh, this is a funny screen. Yeah, it's, it's rear. There's this projector behind it, so it's it's actually it's projection glass. So that's the reason we like to use the, the, the oh, longer way screen. This is a little puddle for me. No, well, you, can, uh, you can do two things at once. I mean, no, I don't. I'm actually very bad. I did that once. It was horrible. Yeah. Was anyway. Well, as long as you don't do like ocular surgery on the audience, what is your point? <laughs> <laughs> I've seen uh, guys get excited. Yeah. They're ducking the veins. You know? Yeah. Take that thing away from that guy. All right. So, I'll let you do that. The power supply? Uh, no, uh, USB. No, we're, we're not going to connect your device. All you're going to do is log in to the link that Vinny sent you for the, for the Zoom. Okay. And then I will admit you as a panel. Okay. You bring up your presentation. Ah, uh, that's Through the Zoom. So okay. That, that's, how, that's how everybody's doing. So you pull the HDMI out here, we'll disconnect the Zoom, okay. and then everybody in the field will, will be able to follow. Um, Sir, you're doing great. I'm doing great. I just I'm worried about. Is there is there? Is there is, okay, did anyone the use the thing that we have? Change pages. Change point nine. I know, I know, but I know. I guess everybody in green. You do the red ones. They go right through. That's the reason. Do you have the laser? Can also flip pages. Yes. Did you try? Because this thing eats up red. Red is not going to be. Is yours green? Yeah. You do more. Okay. Ah. All right. Maybe this is the solution. Because I'm very bad at, at, at coordinating my left and right hand. Uh, it was, That's okay. You're going to be the brain. <laughs> okay, so don't let get you down. Oh, okay, so maybe some will see. I'd rather be uncoordinated with my left. All right. Uh, oh, yes, I'll get size. Oh, look, can I do it? It's a very hard Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, 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 What's the trick for the laser? laser? It's flicking very nice. Oh, oh it's oh, 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 Oh, it's trying to be all right. There are options for change to use. I just did one thing. I did the whole thing. All right. That's a very bad one. You can see it. You can see it. I see. So, 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 this is my whole detail. Oh, that's a disadvantage for every one or two. All right. This is nice. The model number 11. Yeah, I just need to get them out. Okay. Might be a trend. Probably you have to be with a blue screen. That's pretty easy. It's floating everywhere. Maybe I should adjust sensitivity. Is that what it is? Uh, I think it's, yeah, it's very good. Oh, there's a 
one you can change. Three bucks. 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 Oh, yeah. I should be able to check it out. Uh, uh, the 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 but why it's too sensitive, you see? <laughs> it, 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 very sensitive to flying everywhere. I'd like to thank uh, my collaborators, both in theory and in experiment. And I have a lot of slides, so I'm going uh, to not go through each individual of them. So uh, I will talk about uh, dope turn insulators as a way uh, to reach topological pair density waves in uh, uh, these uh, new family of Kagami superconductors. So materials were discovered in 2019 and uh, by the group of uh, Brandon Ortiz and Stephen Wilson. And they were looking for Zintel and Timonite thermoelectrics at the time. And they found this stable uh, new ternary phase of alkaline metals, uh, vanadium and antimony. They're layered, exfoliable, and stable in air. What's really amazing is the vanadium formed a perfect uh, Kagami lattice, uh, Kagami net, uh, which is coordinated by antimony both in plane at the center of the hexagon and out of plane above and below the triangles. So uh, all of these three compounds undergo charge density wave transitions. These are different charge density wave uh, transition temperatures. Here it's uh, cesium uh, at 94K. And they're high mobility uh, metals, uh, two dimensional, uh, giving a resistivity and isotropy about 600. What's interesting is above the CDW transition, uh, the uh, magnetization shows poly uh, magnetic susceptibility. Um, all three compounds, if you cool it down, uh, they undergo superconducting transition at these temperatures. Again, this is shown for cesium at 2.5 uh, Kelvin. So this is the first ideal quasi T Kagami superconductor. So, uh, there is, after the uh, uh, discovery of superconductivity in less than a year, there's like over a hundred papers, uh, most of them experimental posted. So there is no way for me to uh, do justice here. So I'll sort of summarize the essential phenomenology 
And we know there is a charge density wave that happens around 100K. And all of them go into superconducting state between 1K and 3K. And it turns out everything at all uh, is interesting. Uh, first of all, there is giant uh, anomalous Hall effect. And more recently, there is Lerns effect, uh, anomalous Lerns effect being observed. Uh, there is a chiral CDW that onsets, uh, and it might break time reversal symmetry as indicated by mu SR and curl rotation. And rotation symmetry seems to be broken too, and uh, there are large stride order, and at very low temperatures, you see pair density waves and pseudo gap behavior, and most likely this can be a quote unquote unconventional superconductor. There is plenty of debate about having nodes or not. Uh, that's going to be the first half. So the second half, second 10 minutes, I'll ask, is there a common physical mechanism behind all of these behaviors? And I'll try to argue, and there is one that's a doped orbital turn insulator that arises in the time reversal symmetry breaking charge density wave here on the Kagami nuts. And in particular, I'll point out the existence of turn pockets or the likelihood of having turn pockets with concentrated barrier curvature can explain some of these observations and can also uh, lead to chiral uh, topological pair density waves. So this is the uh, uh, anomalous Hall effect. Uh, the value uh, is really large. It's on the order of some of these magnets, this triangle, uh, sorry, this uh, uh, Kagami magnets. And despite that, there is no magnetism in this material. And you can pull out the intrinsic part that's still quite large, about 500 uh, inverse ohm centimeters. Um, and the same effect is observed on cesium based compound as well as uh, the uh, potassium compound. And the anomalous Hall effect disappears above the uh, CDW transition. So let's take a closer look at the CDW state. If you go above the CDW transition, above 78,000, you see the Bragg peaks in STM. Uh, topography, but if you go below uh, the CDW transition, you see the emergence of the six half Bragg peak spots. These are the two by two CDW uh, uh, peaks. So that is also happening in the conductance, the IDV. Uh, if you look at the density of states, what happened is you go into the CDW state, you open up a gap about 50, uh, 40 to 50 uh, milliEV. And this is confirmed by uh, ARPES. Now we looked at this thing uh, at low energy in more detail. As you can see, this CDW peaks, they're not all of the same height. Uh, there are some symmetry making happening. And if you look at, these are in three different sample regions, you see that uh, there is a lower intensity peak and the middle one in the other direction and highest in the third direction. So, on the hexagonal structure, when this happens, you break a symmetry and you actually break all reflection symmetry. And therefore the only thing, uh, this must be a chiral state. And here I show an unpublished data where you see two domains of different chirality. This one going left-handed, this is uh, right-handed. What's more surprising is this zero, time, uh, zero field chirality, I would call it, actually couples to magnetic field. Uh, when the field is along one direction, it's a Z direction field, uh, two Tesla point upward, uh, you see the chirality remains. But if you flip the field direction at two Tesla, the chirality uh, switches. So based on this, we made a conjecture that the CDW state is chiral and perhaps also break time reversal symmetry. It may be a, manif uh, a uh, particular case of the staggered flux or orbital current state which also goes under the name of uh, D-density waves or loop currents in the cool rates. Um, now, is this chiral charge order a robust STM observation? So this is a central question. So Ilya's group uh, at DC took the same samples from Stephen and did STM on, on this, these samples. At low temperature, 4.5K, this is over much larger regions. So you see this single pixel resolution of the Fourier transform. And again, there are these three half rack peak spots representing the two by two CDW. But in his case, probably better here, you see two directions are always the same. Only one direction is different, right? 
So this tells us there is no chirality. And what we have here is a C2 symmetry breaking, but it maintains, it preserves reflection. And uh, uh, you put a field on, these are the intensities along the three Q directions. They don't depend on field. So um, they don't couple to the field, to the C axis uh, field. And these are two domains where the C2 axis, I said it does break rotation down to C2. These are two C2 domains and that rotates by 60 degrees, but in neither domain there is chirality. So there is an intensive debate about whether there is chiral order or time reversal symmetry breaking from STM. Um, but this actually motivated experimental probes that are more uh, tailored towards detecting time reversal symmetry breaking are muon spin rotation in KVS, this potassium compound. You see below the CDW transition, there is a change, an increase in the relaxation rate, suggesting there is probably a emergence of local field. Um, another group uh, did this on CVS. I have it right here C uh, on the cesium compound that has the CDW transition at 90K. Now you see the onset of increase, of the uh, muon relaxation happens at temperatures below CDW, but there is something there at 70K. And they also observe something uh, below 70 at 30K. Now, most recently, the uh, polar curve rotation experiment is done on the cesium compound. And you should polarize light and you look at the reflected light and look at the polarization uh, rotation, and they found there is indeed a really large uh, curve rotation. This is milliradiant, much, much larger than they expected. And that onsets at the CDW transition. So indicating there is time reversal symmetry breaking. In addition, they find this polarization dependence to have only C2 symmetry. So they conclude that this might be a, a uh, CDW state that breaks both rotation and time reversal symmetry. So um, let me come back to STM. Now this is STM in cesium based compound. And you see this six half Bragg peak spots representing the two by two CDW. But then at low temperatures, you see there is an emergence of two other spots here. These are at the quarter of the uh, reciprocal lattice vector in this direction, representing these stripes, as you can see here. These are 4A naught uh, modulations, um, so unidirectional charge order, and that onsets at around uh, 60 to 50 K. And this turns to be the same temperature range where if you do angular dependent magneto resistance measurement, you will see a rotation symmetry breaking in the transport. So uh, there are more interesting things in that paper I won't go into. And uh, let me turn to superconducting state. There are also puzzles there. And here, this is a, a, device, a, a setup that has 30 millik base temperature. So you calibrate the electron temperature to be about 300 millikelvin in the superconducting state. You see both in topography and by DV maps, uh, you see the six two by two CDW peaks and these two, Four in our charge stripes. So the superconductivity coexists with both CDW. Now, if you look at the typical DI, well, spatially average DIDV curve, you find that the density of states shows a V-shaped gap, right? And with residual density of states at zero bias. And you take the uh, uh, gap size and the TC, you form a two delta over TC ratio on the order of five. So these, these are strong coupling superconductors. Now, if we look at what happens at low uh, energy or low bias, this one is at 20. Now, let me go to five millivolt. You see there are some additional modulations here. And these are all the peaks that we had, CDW and stripe. And there are additional features here. And these are peaks at three quarters of the Bragg uh, wave vector or the uh, reciprocal lattice vector. So that comes, that corresponds to four A naught over three modulations in three directions, right? And these peaks are robust within five milli uh, volts. Um, in fact, they're there even before you do the Fourier transform. Here is just the raw data. 
And here you filter out some peaks and the QPIs, you get this 4A0 over 3 by 4A0 over 3 modulations. Now we were asking whether this is, uh, uh, how does superconductivity couple to these modulations? And it turned out that all properties of superconductivity that you can see by spectroscopy couples to these modulations. Here is a line cut, the IDV line cut, and you can get the gap uh, from the spectra, and these gaps modulate in space. And if you do the Fourier transform, it has a peak at uh, three quarters of the Bragg peak. And you uh, can get this gap uh, in two dimensions and form a gap map and do the Fourier transform of the gap. Again, they have these additional peaks, the three quarters peaks. You can also look at the height of the coherence peak, which usually represents some sort of superfluid density, or you can look at the magnitude of the zero bias conductance, that's a representation of the normal fluid density, or the gap depth by subtracting these two quantities. And all of these quantities show spatial modulations and that contain this 4A0 over three period. And in fact, the superfluid density is anti-correlated with the normal fluid density that you see at zero bias. So based on these, we concluded that this, these are modulations are due to a triple Q 4A0 over three by 4A0 over three pair density wave at this wave vector. So I want to convince you that's the case. Now, if it's a pair density wave, then it should have other signatures in the spectrum. And here I showed you the uh, low temperature zero Tesla spectrum. Obviously, you see that there is some pseudo gaps uh, in the spectrum, right? I'm going to focus on this energy and map out its spatial modulation. And that turns out to have this uh, 4 0 over 3 modulations as well. So there is a PDW pseudo gap that modulate at this wave vector. So now let me then apply a field uh, so that I see these uh, vortices, the vortex lattice, and go to the vortex halo. Again, there you see these uh, six peaks at three quarters of the uh, 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 at, at three uh, three quarters of the Bragg peak. Now these two are non-superconducting state. One is at two Tesla, where you completely kill superconductivity. You see these oscillations, and this one is heating above Tc to about 4.2 uh, Kelvin in zero field. This we would call a zero temperature pseudo. So this one, it would be a zero temperature pseudo gap phase. This would be a finite temperature pseudo gap phase above TC. Again, these modulations are there. So based on all of these, we conjectured, uh, there is a triple Q pair density wave at this periodicity. And this pair density wave is a primary pair density wave, a mother state, in the sense that it generates the pseudo gap behavior. So the question is, how would you see a pair density wave above TC, right? And it turns out the pair density wave uh, induces secondary or subsidiary density waves at either twice this PDW wave vector, which happens to coincide with the two by two CDW on the hexagonal lattice, or at difference two PDW wave vectors. But because of hexagonal symmetry, the difference of the two vectors give you back the PDW wave vector. So you add the PDW wave vector, you observe as a, a intertwined CDW order. And that's how STM uh, is able to see that. So in this interpretation, then the pseudo gap above P is a fluctuating pair density wave that induces a coexisting CDW at the PDW wave vector. And just like, a, well, quite similar or different incarnation of the PDW phenomenology incorporates. So now let me go into the theory part and try to pro provide some uh, uh, argument for what might be going on. So these three compounds uh, across the series have similar electronic structures. What's really interesting is here, the d orbitals actually are very close to the Van Hoff point on the Kagami lattice. Right. There is large PD hybridization, but the antimony P bands is at the zone center. And the D orbitals are all active at the zone boundary. So it's a very special Kagami lattice. And these are the Fermi surfaces 
calculated in DST, and they agree with uh, RPES measurement. So what about the CDW? DFT can explain the CDW quite well. It turns out the Kagami lattice likes to breathe, right? There are these breathing modes on the Kagami lattice, and this would be a undistorted Kagami lattice. And these two are breathing modes, two by two breathing Kagami lattice. And uh, this is a star David, this is an inverse star David or a trihexagonal distortion. So it turns out this is unstable because there are phone negative phonon modes. And then these two are both locally stable, but if you calculate the energy as a function of the distortion, you see the inverse star of David has lower energy. So this state might be favorable, right? And the CDW is 3D. There is a stacking of the two by two CDW along the third direction. You can see this phonon mode is also soft. Uh, despite this uh, electron phonon coupling, uh, which can explain the CDW, there is no way that this uh, phonon alone can explain superconductivity because the calculated superconductivity by solving the Macmillan equation is, is very small. So now I want to move from this very complicated band structure to just one band, one or, uh, to one orbital uh, right here. Right? I'm going to mimic this orbital that is close to the Fermi level. And you might think this is crazy. How can such a single orbital model capture this physics? It turns out Kagami lattice is special, and this indeed works to a certain extent. So here I put the Fermi level at the Van Hoff point on the Kagami lattice. And it's a unique feature at this Van Hoff point that is the state at this endpoints are actually localized at respective sub lattices. Right? And that actually promote, uh, that promotes a two by two bound ordered CDW, which indeed was predicted about 10 years ago or eight years ago uh, by functional RG calculation. So now how do we get complex bond order? And that has been really difficult, but various groups have proposed that maybe what happens is this real bond order becomes complex, carry a current and therefore break time reversal as was conjectured there. So this is one of that state, which is the star David state. You have three different links but they're complex, so they carry current. And three uh, and four plaquette fluxes, right? The total flux within a two by two unit cell is zero. So it breaks time reversal symmetry. And this is a staggered flux phase or a orbital anti ferromagnet. And we worked with these uh, um, in the cuprates for a long time, but here something is different. On the high lattice, they can be topological. Um, in fact, if I make a complex CDW, bound CDW this way, um, I'll get a orbital turn insulator at the Van Hoff filling. So I'm going to show you that. But before I do that, let me just remind you, they're close to, the Fermi level is close to Van Hoff filling, but not exactly on it. So I moved it up a little bit. So you can see here, electron doping the Van Hoff point. And we put this flux phase in and this is the energy spectrum. All the bands acquire turn numbers. And if you were at Van Hoff field, you would get a, a orbital turn insulator, but you're away. So you actually dope into this turn number minus three band. And this gives you uh, these pockets that I would call turn Fermi pockets simply because you're doping a turn band, right? And these turn pockets have sizes quite comparable to what was uh, seen in quantum oscillations. So I'll show you the quantum oscillation data. These are coming out in PRX. And the key message is there are low frequency orbits that you cannot explain just simply by the DFT band, right? And these people uh, actually folded the band, right? There's a Fermi surface construction and they try to produce these small pockets and they still could not produce all the low frequency pockets that's seen in these oscillations. Another group has done, uh, again, coming out uh, in PRX, uh, same conclusion or similar conclusion about four low frequency orbits that they could not account for. But there is one additional message in these measurements that certain small pockets actually carry very large Berry curvature. And that would be what I would call the term pockets. 
So let me show you the properties of the chairman pockets. They're right here. They almost most of the uh, very curvature are concentrated on these term pockets, kind of like in twisted bilayer graphene off of integer filling, you will see that the uh, very curvature concentrate the pocket. So this leads to a, a, a intrinsic anomalous Hall conductivity, uh, which we calculate here for all the occupied bands and the pockets. The pockets make a huge contribution. And if you just take the C-axis lattice constant, this gives you anomalous Hall conductivity about 500, quite close to experimental estimate. Now, there are these turn pockets also carry orbital magnetic moment. And these orbital magnetic moment will couple to an external field through the orbital Zeeman effect. And could this be the reason that the STM of the Princeton group actually see some coupling of the chirality to the uh, magnetic field, and we're looking into this. There is also a thermodynamic magnetization, orbital magnetization, and that enters the grand potential. And this is about 0 0.08 uh, mu v per, per vanadium atom. So it should be detectable. Perhaps the most important consequence of these pockets is that they introduce new wave vectors because now they're connected either by quarter G or three quarters G. G is the reciprocal lattice vector. And the uh, same colored pockets are actually connected by quarter G. You can fold them. And the uh, different colors are connected by three quarters of the Bragg vector. And these are the vectors that see in the PDW. So we were really excited. Now, these pockets are all electron-like. So you wouldn't imagine there will be additional charge density wave because they're all electron pockets. Uh, but if you go to the particle-particle channel, you don't care. Hot electron or hole, you don't care. So this motivated, so if you, do, if you did that, the pocket will always be there. You can't gap them all. But if you go to the particle-particle channel, then you make a pair density wave. You pair an electron here with the minus K here, and then you shift it, you get by this wave vector. And that would give you a PDW with this four third uh, A naught period. And the reason we take the four third, uh, well, three quarters T is because these guys carry most of the spectral wave. These uh, other ones are much smaller. Okay, so let me show you how these uh, CDW, uh, this PDW look like. And we can construct this just for on-site, simple BCS like on-site spin singlet pairing, but make a PDW with the six Qs, right? Plus minus of the three Qs. Oh yeah, okay, I'm gonna speed up. So let me show this. So this is the, uh, uh, there are many, many PDWs. That's the problem. There are uh, uh, large degrees of freedom, but the two most prominent ones can be written this way, characterized by a phase factor. If I take L equals to zero, I get a real P, uh, PDW. And this is the real PDW. It, it's a emergent triangular lattice, right? Where the amplitude of the pairing order parameter modulate, right? And now more interestingly is that L equals to one. L equals to one looks like this. There is an emergent Kagami lattice formed out of the PDW with, uh, amplitude. And uh, you can see here, because it's complex, the wave function got zeros, and the zeros are the center of the hexagon or the center of the triangle. So they are actually emergent vortex and anti-vortex lattice, right? Because of this reason, uh, in the experimental paper, we just call it a Rotan PDW, thinking Rotan is a closely bound pair of vortex and anti-vortex. So let me quickly go through what happens in the presence of the PDW you open up gap, you gap out all the pockets. In fact, uh, this real PDW and complex PDW are nearly degenerate. In the phenomenological model, we can't tell the difference in energy, but there are three quasi-particle bands. They're all gapped. They correspond to three different colored pockets here. And if you compare the density of states, you see there are three PDW peaks, right? And this looks like very close to the experiment I showed you a minute ago that there are these multiple peaks in the density of states. So now this is for a very large energy scale. So I'm gonna reduce this energy scale by one order magnitude and see what happens. And there you go, the gap is not really visible. You have to blow it up to see that indeed they're all gap, but there are these linearly dispersive bands like 
coming to these Dirac-like points. And that produces the V-shaped density of states, again, in the middle of these PDW peaks. And for some estimate of the uh, parameters, you can get something quite close to the experiment. So that puzzled us why there is, I mean, there is no nesting of these pockets, but why there is a full gap. So we reduced the amplitude even further. The full gap is still there, right? It seems like, uh, unlike the PDW in the cuprates, which only gapping the antinodal portion, this is killing all the pockets. Then we realize actually there is a very interesting phenomenon on the hexagonal hy lattice. If you have PDWs at three different queues, you form this secondary order, and that is at zero momentum. So there is a intertwined BCS instability of uniform superconductivity that comes with this PDW. Uh, if the PDW is real, then it connects, if the PDW is complex, it looks like there is a chiral PDW. So because this uniform component completely gets out all the pockets, now you can talk about the state, its topological properties. Right? So this is my last transparency. Um, the BDG equations are in class D in 2D because the CDW already broke time reversal symmetry for both of these PDWs. And they're characterized by an integer n, uh, which is uh, really just the sum of the 10 numbers of the uh, quasi particle bands. And you can calculate that it's equal to two in this case. So that says there are two chiral charge neutral chiral Marana edge modes. So now we take the Kagami lattice and wrap it around, make a cylinder with open boundary. And indeed, you can see the energy spectrum shows these chi uh, two uh, Cairo Marana edge states uh, pairwise localized on these two different sides. So this really says a two by two CDW, complex CDW, plus this PDW state is a way to get a chiral, intrinsic chiral topological superconductor. And the mechanism is through that of a dope turn insulator. Uh, instead of going through the summary, I'm running out of time. I'll just put this as a summary page. Okay. Thank you. So you have 12 uh, electron pockets. And uh, so uh, do the quantum oscillation show one over 12 fundamental frequencies? Yeah, uh, first of all, yeah, they are, they are, they are three, right? There are, there are 12, but the same color ones are related by the lattice vector, right? So, uh, but we only have one air, one size of the orbit. So uh, in quantum oscillation, they see four. One, come, one can come from the DFT accidental pocket. Right. And then they folded the DFT band and they see the emergence of another one. So there are at least two more small pockets that are missing. Don't know where to locate them. And they're of the same size, similar size. I mean, this we can adjust to the size. Does that answer your question? Uh, do you have the data? Uh, do you have the data? The data? Yeah, uh, quantum oscillation data. Oh. Yeah. The two, yeah. Uh, I'll go to the one from Stephen Wilson's group, that is the one that they try to, uh, yeah. So there are these four low fre uh, frequencies, small pockets, and one of them from band structure might account for one of them. And the rest, what they did is they folded, right? these are k equal to zero and k equals to pi. Yeah, they folded them still can't account for all the small pockets. Okay. Yeah. So the one that I was drawing there corresponds to one that's here. This center one would be in the gamma k direction, would be this guy. Yeah. Nice talk. Uh, my question is, what is stabilizing the PDW in your model? That's the first point. Yeah. And the second is, you are explicitly breaking time reversal in your model because you have put in the CDW. Yeah, and so because you have the churn band, that, that that's responsible for the very curvature. Right, and so you're explicitly breaking time reversal. Yeah, and why would you call it a PDW? Because that wouldn't uh, uh, oh. technically, you know, because you you, you kind of want to spontaneously break the 
uh, translational symmetry of the lat of the lattice. And so, right. Yeah. So, right. so let me go backtrack. I think I'll go with your second question first. Uh, why do I call it a PDW? It's an okay. So the PDW comes because the CDW produces pockets. This doesn't care if you break time reversal symmetry or not. If you a CDW causes Fermi surface reconstruction, and I can have pockets, right? The PDW is a new density wave because of the newly emerged wave vectors. And if there is attraction, then it's very energetically favorable to pair these guys as in here. So the PDW has nothing to do with the CDW. But then you're assuming that uh, the star of David pattern is responsible for creating the churn bands. The interaction, yeah, but that presumably is not the pairing interaction in the pair channel. So let me answer your first question, yeah. is where could this come from? We don't know. We, we don't know microscopically what is the attraction, right? So, um, so these, th these calculations to take just basically saying, let's just take some S wave attraction, but it, and it is anisotropic in momentum space. Okay, so, so yeah. yeah. So let me, let me just comment on that. Uh, in the coup rates, these current can produce attraction, right? These are the uh, ampering pairing of Patrick Lee or the fluctuating loop current of Chandra Verma. The, the, they can generate attraction. So could this be part of it is, uh, we don't know. Okay, I mean, so you don't answer the stability problem in your, no, in your model. Okay. No, sorry, I, yeah, this is completely phenomenological. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Jicheng, yeah. wonderful talk. Uh, I have your theorist, so I have some critical experimental uh, uh, comment. And also I have some uh, theory questions. First, STM, I'm not STM uh, expert, but let's say if you do a diffraction experiment, yes. if you do diffraction yeah. plus K minus K, yeah. Usually they are saying C2 is guaranteed. Yeah. He's guaranteed yeah. if it's an elastic scattering experiment. Yeah. If it is an inelastic scattering experiment, then plus K minus can be different in principle. Right. Not always, but it yeah. can be different. Yeah. Now, when you do STM, right. you take a real space image and then you take a free transform. I, so I, listen, I, no, please listen, please. Yeah. If you take a, a free transform, of uh, uh, STM image, always plus K is the same with the minus K. So when you have a C3 or C6 type problem, so let's say sample is a C3 or C6. Let's say C3, I think it's a C3 here. Yeah. So C3 problem, if there is some way, if you introduce, uh, let's say C2, additional anisotropy in the problem, you always get the kind of things you discussed. So chiral charge density wave first discussed for TISE2. Uh, I'm not STM expert. I see STM expert here, but the problem is this. If you look at C3 problem with STM tip, which is not 100% isotropy. Let's say your tip has a C2 and isotropy, a little bit elongated along one direction. Okay. so. Ellipsoidal type uh, STM tip coming in to your C3 problem. Then, if you don't have a perfect match between, between C3 and C2, if there is slight misalignment, then in your uh, uh, free transform the uh, uh, dip, uh, diffraction image, you always have one, two, three, or one, three, two yes. intensity. Always, no yes. exception. You always have a one, two, three, and one, three, two. So people, many people interpret them as a indication of a chiral, you know, something, chiral charge density wave. It can be chiral, yeah. but that data alone is not enough at all. Absolutely. There are many papers published on this, but yeah. experimentally that's incorrect. Yeah. That's not confirmation of a chirality. Okay, yeah. so I think the community, our community is very confused about this. I think this is a, something experimentally very important issue. Okay, so okay. that's it. Can I respond to you comment. before I forget your, your, your question? You get two. So let yeah, me first so address, let me address the first okay. one. Yeah. The first one is STM are the first to see these things, but X-ray diffraction has been done. 
it's two by two by two. So those those things are seen. No, no, by two by two is not chiral. That doesn't mean it's chiral. No, no, no. I'm getting to the second question: oh. whether there is chiral. STM, just like you said, it's not really the measurement for that. So go, going back to here, uh, so the criticism is for the, uh, uh, it's very well received. The, uh, the Princeton group data, uh, in, whether that indicates chirality or not, just because the three peaks of different height, right? But in, uh, in the PC data, the data says there is no chirality. There is only C2 breaking. It was actually checked very carefully about the tip anisotropy. So, uh, uh, yeah, your points are all very well taken. Uh, for example, here. So, uh, this is not due to tip effect because you see the domain boundary. No, no. If you have a C3 twins, you always have this. Well, you don't, if you yeah. have C3 and then yeah. C3 flip, you're going to always this. Not this one. Yes. Yes, you do. This one doesn't have chirality. Oh, well, okay. So yes. No, 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 no. So it's, yeah. So, so your your the objection is about this, which I completely so the agree previous with uh, you. domains. It yeah, can be C three domains. C three uh, is this. So that one. That is a C three right. domains. Right. This is definitely questionable, and yes. in fact, STM because you know because this is not affirmative, so there's muon spin rotation. And those that's, things which are that's different. Time, yeah, time, that's a time, time, that's part. time yeah, that's yeah, different. I completely agree with you. Yeah, so you agree on yeah. this, right? I think this so, is probably one of the main reasons that uh, so uh, nature no, no, fix well, actually. I don't want to take my own talk time. <laughs> I think we need to move on. Yeah. So, so, so took this uh, this paper. In principle, it's, it's uh, under uh, what's that stage? Uh, acceptance in, in principle. Yeah, you're not allowed to say that. <laughs> okay. No, but, but I mean, there, I mean, I, I, my question is: is there really no thermodynamic evidence for the uh, C four? I mean, not, not for the for the for the the, the this nature papers claim of uh, there's zero thermodynamic evidence for charge ordinary. I mean, the two by two, there's very strong thermodynamic evidence, right? I mean, there's a lower temperature. This whatever. Look, this, these two are STM works. I know. Right? You can't ask an STM work to give you thermodynamic. No, no, evidence, but I mean, if right? you. If you're gonna if you're gonna claim that the stuff is actually bulk and really you know associated with the pairing, I mean it has to be bulk, right? Yeah. So for example, the uh, uh, let me go to here. This one is seen in transport. I I still it's not thermodynamic, but at least you see it in transport when you do the rotation angular dependent magneto resistance. There is an onset of anisotropy that happens exactly at this temperature, right? That's a, that's as much as as okay, uh, they can see. Thank you, Johnny, again. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I won't. Okay, so next stop. Like, stop the share. Oh, stop the share. Stop the share. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Very good. Let's see if this works. No. Where is my? Okay, let's try again. Take out. Oh, I can go back. That's good. Uh, somehow, my laser is not coming. So let's use this laser. It works, right? Okay, good. Okay, good. So uh, great pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm a part of uh, uh, this center. It's called R SEM. Mesco. Okay. So uh, uh, something called R SEM. Yes, I'm a part of this. 
uh, it's a little different from RCQM. Here, R stands for curse. This R is, I believe, vice. <laughs> and uh, we started this uh, uh, 2006. By then, immersion was a popular word. But we put that uh, here. But now, this is uh, quantum is more popular. So uh, this is probably more trendy. So the tree here, uh, the flower, you see this, this is something called hysteria. So uh, it goes up like this uh, with uh, this twisting. So there's a uh, uh, chirality. So this chirality is very popular in chemistry as well as uh, biology. Now this comes into physics. Then this is what happens. Pretty much everything becomes kiter. Kiter this, kiter that. I think yesterday and today we heard a lot of chirality. The longest one we heard is uh, uh, just we heard kiter topological pair dense wave. I heard uh, even kiter vacuum this morning, and I heard even kiter superconductivity from googling this. So a lot of chirality. Uh, Many of them are real and true, but very often, if something rotating, people tend to call this as a kite. People call this uh, something rotating as a kite. That's not enough. So my talk is based on uh, uh, these five papers. I refer to as uh, paper one, two, three, four, five. I'm experimentalist. I'm not a theorist. But uh, uh, this is, these papers are based on some very symmetry uh, consideration and some uh, uh, kind of useful uh, symmetry uh, handbook for experimentalists, I believe. Use this concept of something we call symmetry operational similarity, SOS. But most of my talk is based on this uh, uh, most recent uh, paper. So chirality, uh, this image and it's a uh, mirror image we cannot overlap to each other through any spatial rotations. We cannot overlap to each other. Now we know this uh, identity. Inversion equals mirror times C2 rotation. Since we allow spatial rotation freely, we can uh, ignore this one, but it means that inversion is the same with mirror symmetry. So when mirror symmetries are all broken, even if we allow any spatial rotation, that means uh, uh, inversion symmetry is also broken. When you have this uh, uh, chiral object, uh, which is well defined, then uh, we have a so-called uh, optical activity, natural activity, linearly polarized light going through this chiral material. There is a polarization rotation, that we call uh, natural optical activity. That's related with a Faraday federal, federal rotation for ferro magnetism. But this case, it is a non-reciprocal effect. However, uh, natural optical activity is a reciprocal effect. If you have uh, uh, this chirality, and then if you apply magnetic field, it shows a so-called directional non-reciprocity, uh, sometimes called as a magnetic or chiral effect. So uh, that you can see uh, using this uh, simple SOS concept. So chirality combined with magnetic field has the same symmetry with this uh, velocity vector or uh, linear momentum. They have the same symmetry, so they do have SOS relationship. If anything having SOS with a uh, velocity vector, they tend to show directional non reciprocity. This chiral case is uh, something called the magneto chiral effect. So, for example, like this chiral motor, this oxide, if you apply magnetic field, sample is here going plus K and minus K, they have a different absorption. So this is a magneto chiral effect. If you uh, twist uh, graphene, very popular topic, then naturally it becomes uh, uh, chiral. So it should show uh, natural optical activity as well as a magneto chiral effect. Uh, in fact, in one of those paper, I believe this uh, uh, paper number four, we say a twisted field by layer is chiral, so it exhibits a natural optical activity and should exhibit non reciprocal optical and also transport effects in the presence of a magnetic field, which needs to be experimentally verified. It was uh, last year, uh, this year, uh, this uh, unidirectional magnetic resistance in twisted by layer graphene. So uh, that was confirmed. So this transport part has been confirmed. 
uh, this optical part has not been confirmed yet, as far as I know. Now, when you have an electric plane rotating like this, so uh, similar with this yin yang symbol, I call this yin, mirror reflection of uh, this image, like yang. So these two images, if you simply flip this spatial rotation, you can overlap each other so that this is not chiral. So this kind of object or that kind of object, I call uh, ferro rotation. So, some other people call it ferro action. Now, if you have a ferro rotation, then if you apply electric field, let's say we call this uh, yin, there is a yang, so a mirror reflection we can connect, or C2 rotation we can connect. If you apply electric field, same direction like this, then this object has SOS with chiral object, same symmetry with chiral object. Uh, so uh, they should show uh, natural optical activity in different way. This uh, uh, ferro rotational object is very difficult to visualize. Imaging federal rotation domains are very much difficult, but apply electric field since they show opposite natural activity. Uh, one can uh, uh, show, one can uh, uh, visualize a federal rotation domains, and that was proposed uh, in this paper. And and after this paper, two D chiral plus a polar field. Correct, correct. Two D chiral plus polar field. Now uh, it does show natural optical activity because it has same symmetry with uh, this spring or screw-like uh, uh, chirality. So uh, after that paper, uh, uh, experimentally, it was in fact co confirmed. So this system has uh, this uh, polarization rotation, ferro rotation. Now if you have an electric field, two different ferro rotation domains can be visualized through natural optical activity. Now, helical spin, so that, uh, we can consider uh, cycloidal spin like this spin rotating in this plane, or uh, helical spin rotating like this. Rotating spin like this, I call helical spin. If you have a helical spin, if the mirror refraction uh, becomes a, a helical spin with opposite rotation, and you cannot overlap each other, so this uh, helical spin is chiral. So this is, uh, uh, I believe, paper number two. So here uh, uh, we, we predict many things. Uh, one of them, very first one is a magnetic helicity. Helical spin has SOS with structural chirality, so it may exhibit optical activity. This has never been done before that. And in fact, uh, very recently in science, there is this paper. So the first time they observed natural optical activity in helical spin system. So we discussed these chiral objects. So uh, again, uh, you can overlap to each other by spatial rotation. Now let's consider some other object that look like chiral. So light, right? Moving this way has electric field and oscillating electric field and oscillating magnetic field. Uh, it does have a handness. It does have a handness. We learned this in uh, high school days. If you do mirror refraction, K direction does change, E direction does not change. However, H direction parallel to, to this mirror, it does change. Then if light left-hand side is left, then right-hand side light is also left. What it means is uh, light is not chiral. Topological insulator surface state, very often people call this uh, uh, chiral surface state. There is a, a spin momentum locking in topological materials uh, at the surface. The surface state, you can visualize like this. There is a K, so K is from center to this point, and then there is a, a spin momentum locking. And at the surface, there is a, uh, uh, basically effective electric field. So this configuration is very much like this. So this state is not chiral. It's not chiral state. If you have a cycloidal spin, again, spin rotating like this on this plane, cycloidal spin, if you do mirror refraction, uh, it does not change. So chiral spin state is uh, a chiral. Same thing with magnon. Many people call this as uh, chiral magnon, chiral magnon. However, so-called chiral magnon is a spin rotating like this. The spin is like the ferromagnetic spin is like this rotating like this. So if you look just the rotating part, it's like a cycloidal spin. So this, there is no mirror symmetry breaking. If you do uh, mirror symmetry on this moving uh, magnon, uh, basically it overlaps to its own image. So uh, magnon, uh, magnons are a chiral. 
So here we list uh, uh, many different uh, spin configurations. Blue arrows are all spins. Many different uh, spin configurations. Uh, let's go through uh, one by one. Uh, spin rotating like this is called uh, uh, toroidal spin moment and be produced by rotating spins. If you do a mirror like this, mirror on this plane, on this screen, then uh, everything uh, changes to direction. However, if you flip, you can overlap. So uh, chiral, this is not chiral, mirror smith is not broken. This is a quadrupole, mirror smith is not broken. However, this uh, uh, toroidal moment, if you combine with out of a plane, out of the screen, uh, uh, if there is spin canting or spin direction spin canting, then if you do mirror refraction, uh, these two objects, you cannot overlap to each other. So this object is higher. So here, uh, uh, red line here means the mirror symmetry is broken. Here, blue uh, T means time reverse symmetry is not broken. So same thing here. This is a, a magnetic quadrant for moment with alternating canted moment. So out of plane direction, plus direction, minus direction, plus minus alternating. This object is also higher. Mirror symmetry is broken. Time reverse symmetry is not broken. I won't go through all of them. Uh, let's say this one, so rotating spin inside here into the plane, outside there, out of plane. So this is so-called skirmium. Block type skirmium is higher. It's higher. Block type skirmium is higher. Let's look at uh, this object. This object is uh, uh, at the center is going in, outside is going out. So this is so-called antiskermion. Antiskermion is not higher. Antiskermion is not higher. Magnetic monopole, magnetic monopole, uh, if you do mirror symmetry, it becomes like this. So you cannot overlap to each other. So it looks like higher. However, in this case, the time reversal is also broken. If you do time reversal on this, time reversal is also broken. When you have a mirror symmetry broken, time reversal is not broken, we call higher. In addition, if time reversal is also broken, then we call higher prime, higher prime. So uh, this, uh, uh, monopole is higher prime. Now this object side going in and then uh, monopole and then outside going out. So this is so-called near type skirmium. Near type skirmium is also uh, chiral prime. So uh, this uh, uh, chiral object like this one having toroidal moment and also canted moment experimentally that was uh, the first time observed in this compound. So barium cobalt silicon oxide uh, uh, it does have uh, uh, this uh, the one in the previous slide is a square lattice version, but uh, in this compound has a triangular lattice. So there is a rotating spin component as well as auto plane spin component. So here, chirality, uh, these two rotation related or time reversal related, but uh, mirror symmetry, if you do mirror become that one, that one become this. So they have a different chirality. One can discuss also scalar chirality, vector chirality. None of them is uh, important. What is important is uh, just the chirality. That's important. So structurally it has a mono chiral system. Magnetic ordering comes in. Let's say if it is a left chiral, we can have only left kind of magnetic configuration. Right kind of magnetic configuration is not possible. So because of that, uh, uh, if you have a, a out of plane, moment, then rotation direction, one direction. If it's out of plane, it's opposite direction, then rotation direction now switches. In this particular compound, it's very compl complex system. In any case, uh, there are three magnetic sub lattices and a blue one, red one, and light blue one, and blue one rotating one direction. Uh, uh, the red one also same direction rotation through the moment, but the light blue one rotation is opposite. So uh, these two uh, outer plane, we have a plus direction uh, can moment, but this light blue can the moment is minus opposite direction because they do have a same uh, uh, chirality. If you have a toroidal moment like this, if you apply magnetic field along this direction, then you, one can prove this one has SO with P polarization like this. What it means is uh, this toroidal moment should have a, uh, should have a, uh, should have a uh, off diagonal linear M effect, off diagonal linear effect uh, should exist. So uh, that we can uh, beautifully prove. Uh, if you apply small magnetic field, uh, three sub lattices, two directions same, third one is different. If you apply large magnetic field, that can go to all same direction, then further moment becomes also same direction. 
So Cantor the moment changes from one to three, we can reverse this direction, then becomes a minus one to minus three. That's a C direction can moment. And when we do that, uh, uh, toroidal moment also switches from minus three, minus one, one, uh, three. This is a, a, a beautiful case, toroidal moment, degree of toroidal moment, you can change the width uh, by your plane magnetic field. When you do that, the system is, uh, has a toroidal moment so that it does have off diagonal linear M effect. That effect also changes from slope one here. So this is a measure of the polarization with magnetic field. So polarization is induced <coughs> linearly. Polarization is also induced linearly after this uh, transition, but slope is a one to three ratio because toroidal moment changes from one to three. And here is minus one, minus three. So the beautiful works uh, in this system. Now, uh, uh, Linka uh, introduced this concept uh, of vector like quantities, there are eight different kinds. We extended the concept to one dimensional objects. So, here uh, we list all, all kinds of uh, one dimensional objects. Uh, I don't have time to discuss what uh, I mean by one dimensional objects, but uh, uh, anyway, so uh, let's say you start from here, let's say polarization. polarization has the same, this uh, cyclic spin has the same symmetry with the polarization. Federal rotation, we call, uh, it, it does have uh, uh, XLE, we call this A, A, and then uh, director like this, and uh, chirality is here. So above here, time reversal symmetry not broken. Now all of them, we can have a time reversal symmetry broken version. So director, chirality, polarization, XLT. So D prime, C prime, P prime, A prime, we can have. And uh, magnetic monopole is uh, uh, C prime. And uh, this toroidal moment itself, without canting moment, that is uh, P prime, it has the same symmetry with uh, uh, linear uh, momentum uh, or K vector. And uh, electric uh, field or polarization magnetic field, if you combine it like that, this has also the same symmetry with this, it does have the same symmetry with K. Now, if you have a, so this is something we just discussed. So this uh, has the same symmetry with uh, this rotating spin, uh, spins, and that has the same symmetry with a K or a velocity vector perpendicular to this uh, plane direction. So what it means is uh, uh, this object can have a directional non reciprocity Imagine any object having SOS with K uh, can have a directional non reciprocity So this object, or that object can have a directional non reciprocity Now, if you consider P and H pointing same direction, you can uh, easily check this is a chiral prime. All mirror symmetry is broken, and also time mirror symmetry is also broken. So it's a chiral prime. If it's a chiral prime, uh, so this uh, object is a chiral prime. What it means is uh, if you have any chiral prime object, then it should show diagonal linear magnetic electric effect. In other words, if you apply magnetic field, you should induce polarization. If you apply electric field, you should induce magnetization. So that's a diagonal, same direction. Diagonal linear magnetic electricity should work for chiral prime. So that's something special about this chiral prime. Now, MOC, we discussed about polar curl effect. So usually people think polar curl effect, uh, you, you need to have a magnetization. Ferromagnetism, you see MOC. Usually it's almost defined for more, that's not true. If you have a uh, uh, these symmetry broken, time you say included, and also on similar symmetry, that uh, symmetry breaking is enough to have a mock. How to break this? Two ways. One is uh, having axiality prime. Magnetization is like axiality prime. Magnetization is like axiality prime, similar with this, but time reversal is also broken. So, uh, uh, so XLT prime, chiral prime, both should exhibit mock effect. So that uh, uh, this uh, morning we discussed about this uh, time reversal symmetry breaking, mirror symmetry all broken, it corresponds chiral prime, so that it can show a mock effect without bulk magnetization. Oh, okay, sorry, too fast. Okay, so these one dimensional objects, one can also define dot product. What it means is A dot B means that they coexist and they can act like a third object. Third object is a one dimensional object. It can, uh, uh, the table uh, can form like this. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go into uh, details. So for example, let me just show, uh, tell you how uh, to read this uh, table. 
If you have a virality, that's a C. If you have magnetization, that's A prime, accelerated prime. So C is here, accelerated prime is here. So C and A prime, if you do that, it's a P prime. P prime is a polarization prime, which corresponds to this K. So you should show non vesicular like that. That's uh, uh, what it means. So that uh, corresponds to this dot product. We can switch this to, so we can see that P prime equals A prime. So that means uh, if you have a chirality, if you have uh, something moving in the chiral object, you induce magnetization. That's what, what it means. So current induced magnetization can be simply explained by this, uh, this uh, uh, dot product. Now, I, I don't see time anywhere here. Oh, there we are. Okay. So what time, when did I start? Yeah, three, minutes. three minutes. Okay, so I have to rush. Uh, so. So this KM system, if you do interpolation structure becomes chiral. In this chiral system, uh, chiral domain coming in like this, vortex, anti vortex type, a very interesting domain structure forms. Uh, here the bottom line is, uh, if you do spin polarized STM, spin polarized STM without magnetic field, you can see different chiral domain has, shows a different contrast. And also if you do STM in the presence of magnetic field, different chiral domain, so if this left, that is white. Uh, those chiral domain uh, does show contrast. That simply can be explained by uh, this uh, uh, cartoon, this dot product. That dot product, this one dimension object, we can also define a cross product like this. So cross product, uh, the way you see is like this. So uh, if you have a chiral P prime, that's a linear momentum that induce uh, uh, magnetization we discussed. So this current induced magnetization is like this, current induced magnetization. If you have a scormion, this is one example. If you have a scormion like this, uh, this rotating uh, spin, that's like a K or P prime and cross product with A prime, then it can uh, produce P. So that corresponds to this one. So P prime, P prime and then A prime, it produces uh, P. So what, it, so, so what it means is uh, this A, this A, the battery is dying, but this A uh, is like this and uh, that can produce polarization. So this two carton, this one adult product, that cross product explains to you topological Hall effect. Topological Hall effect can occur like this, this P produces a uh, Hall effect. If you have uh, uh, this kind of object, well, one should be able to get also topological Hall effect that has never been seen. Okay, so uh, uh, so this is a uh, uh, this is a uh, 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 this uh, in plane uh, magnetic uh, quadruple combined with alternating Cantor uh, moment uh, that has been seen. Uh, uh, where uh, let me just go through it. That has been seen uh, in this compound. So uh, that case also uh, one can do some uh, uh, cross product like this. Uh, since I'm running out of time, so uh, conclusion. Sorry, I was rushing last part a little bit too fast. Uh, but then anyway, my conclusion is here. I, we discussed uh, four different kinds of magnetic chirality, four different kinds. Helical spin is chiral. Toroidal moment plus cantilever moment is chiral. Magnetic quadruple moment plus alternating cantilever moment, that's chiral. Black type scormion, only black type, not anti scormion, not near type scormion, only black type scormion is uh, chiral. Magnetic chirality means uh, 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 spin structure somehow has a chirality. All mirror symmetry is broken, but time reverse symmetry is not broken, even if you allow any spatial rotation. Also, natural uh, optical activity, magnetic chiral effect, and also current induced magnetization. All of them should show that. And some of them having this uh, uh, toroidal spin component does show topological Hall effect. And uh, 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 this uh, uh, strain can also something interesting uh, uh, I didn't discuss. Chirality prime, uh, it does show uh, when additional time of is broken, we have a diagonal linear uh, magnetic electric effect as well as a, a Mock effect. And this uh, chirality prime basically means uh, you may call this as a chirality, but it changes as a function of time. It's not conserved quantity. Uh, when you do time reversal, it, it, it's, it's broken, so then it's not conservative uh, property. When this is combined with uh, some topological or something, then one can get also chiral anomaly. It's all something to do with breaking both symmetries. Okay, so I, I, I think the take home message is, is um, uh, uh, it will be nice. Uh, when we call chiral something, it will be nice to make sure that it's really chiral, number one. Number two, uh, if it is really chiral, uh, it will be wonderful to distinguish whether it's a chiral or chiral prime. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
the really doesn't prove what the system is a ferromagnetic then? I mean, Mock itself? Yeah, Mock no, itself. No, no. Mock itself. I mean, that, what, what about the case that. Well, okay, so. Yeah, the, the this rating is correct. Is if, if, if you see Mock signal, time reverse symmetry is broken. That's a correct statement. But you see Mock signal, and then there is a ferromagnetic net moment. That's an incorrect statement. Okay. Because you need, you need to break additional symmetries more than time reversal. Anti ferromagnetic can show Mock effect, for example. Particularly, that, uh, in fact, I discussed all this chirality. Yeah, uh, chiral prime can show chiral prime. Uh, well, <laughs> sorry. Uh, or I, I showed many examples. Of, did I was just show here? No, the wrong direction. Okay, I cannot change it. One. Okay. Well, anyway, let's move on. Yeah. Uh, so you had this slide where you showed eight different classes with director, director prime, chiral, chiral prime. Uh, I was wondering if you could comment on. Yes, about okay, keep talking, please. Yeah, I was wondering if you could comment on which of those classes are easier to obtain either in nature or in theoretical models, and which ones are very hard to get. Uh, let me get this uh, because I went through that a little too fast. Uh, where is that? Okay, so here, uh, so yes. eight different kinds, and then your question is, which one is easier? To yeah, have? which of these classes are easier to get either in nature or in theoretical models, and which ones are very hard to get? Okay, so uh, I'm not a theorist, but experimentally, what I can tell you is uh, uh, chiral prime, there are many examples. All linear magnetoelectrics, they are insulators, they are all chiral prime. They're all of them are chiral prime. And... Uh, uh, however, uh, 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 this uh, higher uh, object like uh, uh, this uh, where Scormia, there is a lot of uh, research, uh, but the kind of uh, higher uh, object like a toroidal plus a cantilever moment and uh, quadruple moment combined with alternating cantilever moment, that's very special. As far as I know, there are two components only, one component for each.